your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Once again, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Para X Radio Network. Now, the opening music might have sounded a little unfamiliar to um, people that expected some kind of a witchy music or something, but it was um, actually some epic Persian battle music. And when I was reading the blurb about blurb about this song, there was um, a moment that I, on the corner of my eye, saw this comment from a guy who claimed to have been Zoroastrian, and he approved of it. Well, that was enough for me, because that all fits right into tonight's uh, show topic. Now, my guest is Stephen E. Flowers, who received his doctorate in Germanic languages and medieval studies from the University of Texas at Austin, and also studied the history of occultism at the University of Göttingen, and I might have mispronounced that, Germany. (laughs) Um, He's the author of 24 books, including Lords of the Left-Hand Path and Icelandic Magic. And his latest book, Original Magic, The Rituals and Initiations of the Persian Magi, is what we're going to be discussing this evening. And Stephen, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Marla. Nice to speak to you this evening. Glad you're here, because I'm going to be messing up on pronunciation all night long, and I need somebody to fix it for me. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, just hand it. Well, we understand. (laughs) <laughs> Good, because it's just handy that you're going to be here to do that. All right, now, the book is um, a complete guide of ancient Persian magic, and that was the earliest organized system of magic. And um, were you a magical person in another tradition before you learned about this ancient magic, or how did you find your way into it? Oh, yes. Well, as many listeners probably know, I uh, also write under the name Edred Thorson, and that's with the E in uh, my name, Stephen E. Flowers, is my, that's my middle name, Edred, mm-hmm. and I have uh, just studied mainly and written most uh, usually about runes and Germanic mythology and religion, the runic tradition, and so forth. So the 
Iranian material was something that I had been interested in most of my life from my early exposure to it in Germany when I went over. When I was 18 years old, I met some Iranian uh, people there, and uh, and I met several other others along the way throughout the years and studied quite a bit about it in graduate school also. But uh, it... Uh, because the Iranian world and the Germanic world are closely related, actually people wouldn't uh, think that was possible, but mm -hmm. uh, historically this is the case. There, uh, the northern Iranian peoples, the Scythians, Sarmatians, Alans, uh, were actually instrumental in the, the genesis of the Germanic and Celtic peoples. In, uh, in Europe, they touched upon them, and actually what we generally think of as Germanic or Celtic arts, mark forms and design, is actually of Scythian or Sarmatian origin. Hmm. And there was a great... But because these people, these Iranians, were uh, uh, had an oral-based religion and tradition, as most did, uh, there's very little to anything known about them uh, in a written record of these type of people, but uh, they had uh, an enormous impact on the, uh, the formation of the Germanic mythology and religion uh, because this was around 700 B.C. when this contact was made, and it was continuous from that point on for a thousand years. So that, as a comparative study, I'd always been familiar with them. There's a famous spearhead, uh, the runic inscription of spearhead, which also contains many Iranian symbols, so-called tamgas, which were the sort of brand marks that these people had for their horses and livestock and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's something that I've been uh, aware of and so forth, but really the spiritually uh, moment of uh, sort of crisis in my life sort of sparked this interest made, uh, to not, no pun intended, uh, really uh, lit the fire of my interest in this, which is a deep philosophical, uh, magical interest in the problems of uh, good and evil, what that really means, and how the good can be brought into people's lives, my own life uh, first and foremost, just as one of my other books that people probably know under Edward Thorson, I wrote Nine Doors of Midgard, and that is an initiatory system into the runes, but uh, really what that book is, is a record for the most part of what I did for myself in the process of, of uh, discovering the secrets of the runes myself, and then I just merely share that with the world in the form of that book, and very similarly, original magic is another effort in this direction. This is a representation of a curriculum which I uh, undertook for myself, and it worked so fantastically that I decided to share it with the world, and that's what the, this is. The great advantage of the Iranian or Persian tradition is that uh, this is all very, very well documented material as opposed to uh, a lot of the European pagan traditions which are difficult to uh, document in a very precise way. Right. So uh, that is one thing that is a great advantage here. We have living Zoroastrian people who can inform us about many aspects of this. Yeah. Now, just how far back does this magic go? Well, uh, Zarathustra, who's the founder of this uh, system, was a priest in a, the uh, cult of the Iranian peoples, which was very almost identical to the Rig Vedic tradition that they were familiar with uh, from India. Uh, so this goes back to the middle of the the second millennium B.C., probably around seven, 1700 before the Common Era. So 1700 mm -hmm. B.C. 
that we can tell this from the language which Zarathustra uh, recited, his sagathas, which are these songs, and the, line, the level of language, that is the archaicism of that language, indicates that it is uh, at the same time or roughly the same time as the Rigveda, which is uh, among the oldest uh, forms of religious texts we have. Of course, they weren't written, they were orally transmitted. That's one of the things that's amazing about this, and of course this is also true of the Rig Veda, is that people learn these volumes, what would be volumes of text orally from a teacher, and then they recite them. And of course they, they, this way of doing things is much more uh, precise and exact in a, in a written tradition because you have a, a monitor, a teacher sitting there saying, no, that's wrong. You have had that syllable wrong. Repeat. Mm. Get it right. And so when a scribal traditions, such as you have in the Bible and things of that nature, uh, come along, uh, many mistakes are made. And then when a person says, oh, I'm going to recopy this book, those Mistakes are just perpetuated because that's all they have, right? Is this is the text in which these errors occur? So the, there's no recourse to accuracy. But in an oral tradition, the the, the transmission is precise. And Zarathustra, the 1700 before the Common Era, almost 4,000 years ago, yet people still recite learning these texts precisely. Now, that means that much in a, in a very analogous way to the lore that surrounds these the fires that the Zoroastrians have kept burning for hundreds and sometimes even a thousand years. What does that imply? What does that tell you that someone, that the, these texts have been transmitted, I used to take word text to you know, not in a uh, graphic form, but mm -hmm. the, that these words have been transmitted over this thousands of years, that these fires have been kept burning for hundreds and thousands of years, that is an indication of the strength of a society, of a, uh, of a group of people who continue these behaviors in an unbroken way, in a precise way, is a testimony to the strength of that bond. And what uh, Zarathustra, his people, following him, were called the Mazmaga, which means the great fellowship. Mm -hmm. And uh, th these were the first, I, I like to say this, the first true religion, not true in the sense of true-false, but the sense that uh, before this time, when Zarathustra lived, uh, and the, when he had his insight, his daima, his insight into the fact, as he saw it, and as we subsequently realized, that, for example, the gods of which he was an initiated cultic priest were not what people generally thought them to be, that is, uh, anthropomorphic kind of humanoid uh, creatures who were just more immortal and knew a little more and, and were much more powerful than humans, but nevertheless portrayed all of the human foibles and uh, jealousy, rage, uh, hatred, uh, vengeance, all the things that humans had, they had also. As we, and so that's the way he, he, his religion was, or his tradition was. And he had the insight that, no, there is one God that is absolute consciousness, which is wisdom. There is a Lord of wisdom, Lord wisdom, the, and that is the, the true creator God, Ahura Mazda, Lord wisdom. And it is pure, focused consciousness. And all of the other gods and goddesses are... Uh, manifestations of aspects of this entity. Mm -hmm. And they are abstract principles 
philosophical principle. So that his insight was the beginning of philosophy, which the Greeks took many of these ideas from Persia, and even the word philosophy, love of wisdom, is a kind of Persian idea, a love of mazda, love of wisdom. And so that is the origin of it. And his technology, much of his magical technology is what our, this book is about, is uh, he takes the things that he learned in this sort of Vedic-style uh, sacrificial cult and abstract them into a more simplified form, but also in a more technically precise form, so that you have what is could be called a magical religion. And the magic, of course, is a based on a Persian or Iranian word. They call a certain type of priests a magavan, and the ma, magu maga. Uh, word means, it has to do with power, that they are powerful people. Mm -hmm. They are the ones endowed with power. And so they are a priest class in ancient times, but that's where the the word comes from. That's where the idea of this is original magic. This is the the origin of uh, of an idea that uh, magic has a spiritual endeavor for the realization of the self and the empowering of that self to do uh, things effectively in the world. And that is the idea that, that what, what do they, they mean by good? That's very essential to this concept or this whole tradition. That is the, the, the essence of what they're talking about. It can be boiled down to three words in Avestan, Humata, huhta, huhta, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Hmm. But what do they mean by good? They mean effective, correct, uh, potent words, potent and effective deeds. Not, you know, like, uh, oh, goody two-shoes kind of thing. We think good, we think, yeah, good. <laughs> you know, Susie has a nice dress on today or whatever. It's like I'm just kind and thoughtful. That's all very good and all mm-hmm. a good thing. But, but what that really means is that it is uh, effective, potent, mm-hmm. powerful yeah. words, thoughts, and deeds. So that is the essence of it. And there was a technology there inherited from the ancient cult which was uh, applied to this for individual attainment and then for the uh, for, for, for the use of these ideas in the battle in this world against evil, which is the, uh, uh, the opposite of this. That is, it's not just, oh, he's naughty. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zarathustra is called the laughing prophet because he came into the world laughing, not crying, and he... Uh, says we are here as human beings to enjoy life and that at the end of times we will be have our bodies restored in our idyllic perfect states the way we were supposed to be because if the god of consciousness if ahura mazda is the god that, that, that is, is is this perfect form of consciousness that is its creation, excuse me, I shouldn't have said his, because actually that's an important point here, is that uh, Ahura Mazda is a dyadic uh, sort of uh, androgynous entity. Mm -hmm. Ahura is masculine, Mazda is feminine. So Mm -hmm. it is actually an abstract principle beyond the dualities, but it is dyadic. It it, it does to have two sides. Mm Mm-hmm. And so that is the is also an essential uh, part of this. But uh, Hura Mazda says we must be powerful. We as individuals uh, must be empowered to be effective and potent warriors in this. And of course, the war first takes place within ourselves before it can t- take place outwardly. But it is uh, 
uh, very much of a non-violent in the sense that violence is seen as to be a, a, a negative thing, sometimes necessary, but never preferable. Mm-hmm. Even the great expanse of the, the great Persian Empire, uh, the great uh, battles with the, the Greeks, uh, they uh, you see some of these te- uh, some of these battle tactics that they pioneered. For example, archers used to decimate the enemy before uh, you know they would engage them was a way to say we want to get this over with quickly, minimize casualties on our side, and get it over as quickly as possible, as opposed to the Greeks and Romans who like to get in there and really have brutal hand-to-hand combat. That's what they enjoy. That's what they thought was the sort of manly way to fight a battle. Well, you and just put it all. You just put it all <laughs> together in my mind about the opening song. Persian battle music. Uh-huh. I, I, I kind of wondered why the man commented that you know he approved of it. And now you just made it very clear to me that it was you know a good choice in that sense. Right, and uh, Koresh or uh, Cyrus, the first really great emperor of the Persians, was uh, famous for uh, conquering Babylon without a fight mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he just used psychological warfare and considered himself as something as typical of our American uh, sort of uh, ideology today. We hear this all the time, but he uh, truly believed it. That is, I come here as a liberator, not as a conqueror. And would, you know, give credit to the home local deities and not just say, you know, I've come here to conquer you in the name of Ahura Mazda and you will be my slaves now or whatever. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's one of the things in the, uh, all these popular movies about, uh, you know, the 300 and the Spartans and the uh, uh, conflict with the, uh, with the Greeks, uh, between the Greeks and Persians, is that uh, they were uh, postulated in our propaganda, that is the West, as a, a battle of, of freedom-loving West versus a uh, despotic East. Everybody is familiar with that mythology. However, it is totally and absolutely nothing but you know wartime propaganda. In mm-hmm. fact, the, of course, the Greeks and the Romans, half of their populations were slaves. Mm-hmm. And the Persians thought slavery was immoral and didn't have them. They paid their workers a wage. And uh, so that was, they were not despotic uh, in that uh, sense. But they did have this vision, or the the, the inherited from this idea, if there is one God, there should be one sort of a government uh, for the whole world. And that was the first, the dream of, of, of Cyrus the Great and really the first true empire. But he was called, this is a title you've heard about somebody else, the King of Kings, Mm -hmm. the Shah Mm -hmm. on Shah. Because the other guys were also kings. He didn't say, I'm your... See, uh, the Romans, uh, the Roman emperor or the Roman government controls the Gauls. Everybody they conquer are just considered to be just conquered territories that will just be sucked dry mm-hmm. for the sake of Rome. But in hit, but in the case of the Persian Empire, most people were actually wanting to be part of it because it was it was, some, it was a guarantee or a better chance of being peaceful and prosperous. You know, because it was well regulated and, and so forth. It was of course never the dreamland because that no one would uh, you know, ultimately cooperate with uh, the idea. Right. The idea was you'll probably fight less and less violently with the neighbor with whom you have some political connection than you will if you're just one boring faction against another. So right. they, they, these ideas go deeply into the religion as well as into you know, politics and uh, the you know, military history. Mm-hmm. You know, now I'm just going to backpedal just a little bit because you were talking about this being um, such a strong and vital um, practice. And I was reading that, you know, it was once the world's single most influential religious community. And oh, yes. But, but now... All, all, yes, mm. right. 
Right, but now well, it seems that well, there are less than from the – this is what I – got from the internet yes. i don't know how true it is mm-hmm. fewer than yeah. three hundred thousand orthodox mm-hmm. practitioners in the world today now how did it right. how did the the thing kind of snowball down like that one one word or one concept mm-hmm. non-coercion a incredibly important part of the zarathustran philosophy is as far as religion is concerned Mm-hmm. You cannot coerce another individual, and this includes arguing with them, saying, no, you're wrong, come on, this is that. Not that, not polemics, not mm-hmm. violence. You cannot coerce another individual into believing this way or that. They never coerced anyone. Of course, mm-hmm. that's a fatal, you know, I, I'll call that a, high and noble thing, which we continue to practice, but it is a Mm -hmm. fatal flaw when you are competing with cancerous systems whose prime directive is convert them in one way or another is the main purpose of our being. Mm -hmm. Now, Christians tended to be more violent, actually. The uh, Muslims, for example... Uh, use the tax system for the most part. They would conquer a territory, administer it, and tax Muslims at a lower rate than they taxed non-Muslims. And over a century or so of time, for the most part, most people converted for the tax break. <laughs> but they weren't coerced. And yeah. that was a, the thing that, that, that uh, Muhammad you know, took. I mean, most of uh, the practices of Islam are, in great, a uh, great deal of them, are taken directly from Zoroastrianism, praying five times a day, and this non coercion, and the idea that you don't convert to Islam, rather you revert to it because it is the true, natural, and true religion. That those kind of, that kind of argument or that kind of idea is all pure Zoroastrianism. So, and of course, Muhammad being a camel trader or whatever he was, you know, was, it was involved with Persian culture, uh, mm-hmm. you know, intimately. His, when it was Salman, you know, his barber, you know, was the Persian guy. And, and it, it just seems that, uh, hmm, well, that's one of the things we were uh, saying, that the, the idea that it's the most influential. Judaism was totally reconfigured under the influence of, of Zoroastrianism during the time mm-hmm. of the so-called Babylonian captivity. Books of Esther and Daniel and so forth and so on were all written you know, about that you know, time period in, mm-hmm. within that world. They were in Persia, in the Persian Empire. And uh, the whole myth, the Edenic myth, the myth of that there... Uh, but see... The monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, for mm-hmm. example, uh, turn the ideas of Zoroastrianism on their head in the sense that you see that uh, there's an Eden, there's a, a, a garden, which is an essential Persian idea, that, that the fourfold garden called a Charbab uh, in Persian, the mm-hmm. four the garden, so that is how Eden is described as divided by four rivers. You look at Persian gardens at Taj Mahal, wherever you see them, there are four water courses dividing the space into four quadrants. And that's where that comes from. The idea that there was an original uh, man and woman, and there's a tree there, and all this kind of thing. All these images are taken directly from Persian mythology. Mm-hmm. However, the idea of it is, as I said, turned on its head, because what the Jehovah tends to be saying is, I do not want you humans to be knowledgeable or immortal, to eat at the tree of knowledge of good and evil or of life. This is forbidden to you. Whereas Ahura Mazda says, this is necessary. You must eat of this tree and you must eat of that one because I need a fit 
powerful warriors. This is, goes beyond that, however. Uh, human beings, all human beings, this is the essential myth of Zoroastrianism, of the Mazdan way, and that is that when uh, evil, which is just kind of a shadowy thing that arises and then uh, has to be opposed by the good, at that point, Ahura Mazda looks uh, upon the ramparts of his uh, uh, fortis, fortifications mm-hmm. and sees uh, that he has his uh, warriors or his uh, guardians in the millions and billions and uncounted numbers. And they're called the Fravashis. They're spiritual entities, angelic, if you will, entities. And this entity, Ahura Mazda, inserts into their mind this notion that they need to fight for the good. And they are then asked to volunteer for this descent into matter and to become warriors for the good. Mm-hmm. And they do so. A unanimous roar goes up in the cosmos that this is to be. Mm-hmm. And they begin to descend in the billions, millions, and so on. And so that every human being you meet Every human being you see is one of these fravashis. It has one of these fravashis. And as in a better moment, in a more ideal moment, has volunteered to do this, no matter what they appear to be at this moment, no matter what they're doing at this moment, if you see someone who's, oh, that person is so degenerate, that person is so messed up, that person is X, Y, or Z, whatever negative thing you can say about them, those are their wounds. Those are their battle scars, their battle wounds. We shouldn't disdain them. They are our wounded brothers and sisters. You see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's what that's what those uh, all, all of us have as we have come into this world. We are affected by this uh, evil, which the evil is what that is ignorance, violence, uh, oppression, uh, poverty, weakness, sickness. All of these things are the divas. These are the quote, demons, end quote. Not, you see, in the West, we see demons. That's how Satanism can become a legitimate religion, if you will, in the, in the West, because Satan is identified with the serpent, who says to man, hey, eat of the trees. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to be, you need to get up to speed. You need to do that and pull yourself up. You're you're nothing but a, practically a vegetable or a worm the way you're living now. You need to to get uh, uh, your own power and have your own knowledge and your own vitality. And so, it's uh, something that uh, this uh, Hora Mazda is also saying. And so. People in the West, they say, well, you know, a lot of these demons and devils, and say, they seem to be rebelling against oppression, you know? Mm-hmm. And they can be made heroic, you see? They can be made to be images of heroism or uh, rebellion for the sake of justice or good, or whatever. That can be insinuated in someone's mind. But the demons, if you will, the divas, as they're technically called, in Zoroastrianism cannot be put in that position because who wants more ignorance? Who wants more stupidity or poverty or sickness or weakness in their lives? This is what those things are. Mm-hmm. We want the opposite of all those things. And so it's a, uh, that's another thing about this whole religion and the whole magical tradition is that it is also very logical. It doesn't mm-hmm. defy logic. It follows logic. Mm-hmm. 
If a religion is trying to tell you something, it has a tortured and twisted interpretation of what seems to be obviously true to your logical mind, then, you know, it's probably on the wrong side. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's against humanity rather than for it. Mm-hmm. See? And this is a, a religion which is profoundly pro human and pro individual because each one of these harvashis that I spoke about earlier were mm-hmm. individual entities and remain so in this world and will remain so for all eternity. That the individual person is if that person and when that person because it's not a matter of if it's actually a matter of when because mm-hmm. If Ahura Mazda is what it is purported to be, that is, absolute perfect consciousness, then its creation will also eventually attain perfection. So that although a lot of people focus on the idea, hey, these people invented the idea of heaven and hell, which is true, and the idea of punishment and of uh, a uh, judgment at the end of life, Right. And all those things, that's true. But all the interpretations by others were, or have been misinterpretations for the sake of what? Coercion. Well, yeah, and See? interpretation is, is a very important point here because um, when people talk about the Bible, you know, they question whether the, those are the words of God or the interpretation of something they heard that came down the chain. And then to those who actually sat down and wrote the Bible, maybe that's their interpretation, not what it was meant to be. You know, in Judaism, you have rabbis who studied the, the Torah for years, hundreds and thousands of years. Well, not hundreds and thousands, mm-hmm. but they have been studying it that long. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, you, you get a, a group of them in a room together and they're all going to interpret it differently. So it's kind of amazing how this one interpretation can like set and hold. See what I'm, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah, Yeah. right, right. But in this, because there is a component of logic here, uh, there's very little of that. There are uh, Zoroastrian heresies, Mm -hmm. but they don't really exist anymore. They're historically, things like Zurbanism and so forth. I go into some all these things in my uh, book I wrote called The Mazdan Way, which is just put out by my own press, Lone Star, and it's on Amazon, The Mazdan Way. And it goes into all the misconceptions. The idea that Zoroastrianism, for example, focuses on the idea of good and evil. Good must be spirit, and evil is matter. Well, that's a, a most horrible heresy that is absolutely contrary to uh, Zoroastrian or Mazdan philosophy. In fact, the whole idea that Judaism and hence Christianity took over, the idea of the resurrection of the dead at the end of times, that was a Zoroastrian idea. Now, as a person who was uh, in my extreme youth, was brought as a Christian. You know, you hear this idea and you go, well, that is the craziest idea I ever heard. We are more comfortable with an idea of an eternal kind of spiritual existence. But the idea of a, an eternal material existence just seems kind of weird. Mm-hmm. But the Zoroastrian said, no, this is what the end must be because there is nothing that the matter is actually extremely good mm-hmm. if it is good if it is powerful and potent and immortal and healthy it is good and you want to why not have a spirit and a body as we do now the only problem is these divas are interfering almost like a signal someone in communication and relates always very good to this and that is the divas are, are like a jamming of a signal that any kind of communication, as I'm trying to communicate these ideas to people today uh, or this evening, uh, other people are getting contrary signals all the time because there's always this 
thing, they're saying, oh, that's wrong, that guy's stupid, that guy's weird, that guy's messed up, no, don't listen to him, etc. Everything that is trying to come through to make clarity, light, and the force of, uh, of good, I mean, and it is going to be interfered with. Even when you sit down and try to meditate, your body starts rebelling and itching and doing all kinds of things. <laughs> but that's yes, like the diving force saying, that, don't do that, that's silly, that's stupid. And those kind of tapes, you know, that come from wherever and however to interfere with your development, with your empowerment, with your becoming effective and becoming who you actually are. Mm -hmm. That is this pravashi. Uh, and that is the purpose of the magic, is to empower the self to do this, and uh, as far as individual development, but also to use that power in this world and uh, if attainment is followed by uh, potency then in the world, then the world comes, is improved, mm -hmm. each uh, person by person. Now, I want to also bring up the thing about magic because you mention in the book that the magic taught in the book can be used and adapted to all traditions of magic um, as it mm -hmm. has been through the ages, correct? Right, right. That the original idea was taken by various peoples and uh, used uh, uh, the idea that there are angelic entities surrounding the world and we invoke them and they're somehow connected with the stars and the, whether it's Arabic or Judaic or whatever, I mean, a lot of traditions obviously partake of that and that's what this uh, system was and is. That is, uh, e each month, each 30-day cycle has a yazata, which is a god or goddess or one worthy of veneration uh, uh, attached to it. And then each day we have a meditation on that, and we go through a year's curriculum, uh, increasing our level of intellectual and uh, knowledge and spiritual experience through the ritual and through, most importantly, the recitation reading of certain words which are in the Avestan language, which are mantras, very much akin, the same word as you have in Sanskrit, mantra, right. which are but not so much. They are they're meaningful. They can translate them, but they were actually, when you start to study them, as I have, uh, they're uh, grammatical anomalies in them because they were uh, composed for as much, as much, for the sound they made as for the meaning they conveyed. Mm -hmm. And so there's a kind of a sonic uh, power grid there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, the words, for example, let me recite one. It's most uh, the most usual one about the truth, and about truth is the best of all things. And the one who follows uh, the truth or seeks the truth for its own sake is most blessed. Hashem bohu vahishtam asti ushta asti ushta achmai hiat ashai vahishtai Hashem. So that's just a short, but most. Uh, you know, recited mm -hmm. uh, mantra in in the uh, system, mm -hmm. and so uh, it has a, its own sort of power from the sounds as much as from the meaning. Right. They've said many scholars have said, "Well, we sit down and we try we, we translate this, and then we come back to it three hours later, and we translate it again, and it says something a little bit different." <laughs> it's almost like it's some. It's not quite the natural language. It, it died, that language died out long ago, long, long ago. But it's used just for liturgical purposes. Right. And, you know, along those lines, um, in your book on uh, rituals and the chapter on rituals, it's mm -hmm. based on the archaic Persian formulas, and they include, like, fire rituals and divine invocations. And I found it interesting that you said that these rituals can certainly be performed in English. And this is, ties into what you just said. 
but the results probably will not be as forceful as one might expect them to be when if they were using the sacred mantras, right? Right. Yeah, you could you do them in English and say, well, this is what it means, and so on. my mind is focusing on these ideas, but uh, it, it, it's more intellectualized at that point. Whereas the, uh, just like, for example, in the most ordinary kind of medieval grimoire kind of magic, you mm-hmm. know, the so-called barbarous names of power, right? Mm-hmm. Wherein certain gibberish is uh, recited. It, no one can figure out what it actually means, but it, somehow these words are full of power. Well, this tradition is the happy medium where... Yes, they are barbarous and the names of power, if you will, but they also do have meaning and they can be deciphered and they are kind of like a crystal ball in a way to even onto the intellectual. <laughs> that is, they can have different meanings depending on the subjective state of the, of the translator or the, um, the one who is understanding them. So it's a very meditative, magical, process actually itself to 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 recite them to memorize them to train the mind to do that and then also to try then at the next stage to to uh, start to realize the meaning of each word as it is as it is spoken or as you speak it mm-hmm. and then it's a progressive initiatory development for from understanding it not at all to starting to internalize not only the sounds but also the meanings Mm -hmm. and uh, as I said the book contains a a year long curriculum so if you start off just very basic and then and doing the running through day by day each uh, yazata and each thing and then uh, learning and okay and then we'll writing it down, see what I've done, and then taking it progressively to a, a higher, more complex level each as each month goes by. And uh, so, and that is, the, the curriculum is one that is an ancient uh, tradition. It's not something that has been created for this book or that I made up or anything like that. It is mm-hmm. uh, rooted directly in the tradition. Yeah, and that's what I was going to let people know, that the book um, is divided into four parts, um, history, theory, initiation, and practice. And so it's not something that, you know, sometimes you you learn about practices, magic things. This isn't one of those books that you can pick up, read it from cover to cover, and then become a practitioner. it's, It's just not that simple. Um, it's not for people who want a quick fix. Let's put it that way. You have to. This is this is something that takes a commitment, and and time. And but in the back of the book, um, you have a lot of appendixes, appendices. I don't know, uh-huh. <laughs> the plural. Yeah, appendices. Um, mm-hmm. But there there is a guide to things like the pronunciation of Avestan. There's um, 101 names of God. Uh, there's basic Mazdan astrological lore, and there's so much more. And so, like I said, this isn't um, a, a book that's called Original Magic for Dummies because it's way too comprehensive for that. Um, it's a right. study of the philosophy and, as you said, hopefully the ultimate goal here is ushta, which is happiness, mm-hmm. correct? That's mm-hmm. right. That is the, the typical, the greeting, the Zoroastrian greeting and salutation, kind of like aloha, is ushta te, mm-hmm. happiness to you. And that is the ultimate goal of the individual life and of the whole world and of all individuals is that all individuals will be uh, happy and uh, will enjoy mm-hmm. the creation of Ahura Mazda the way it was intended to be without all of these interferences. It cannot be ascribed to a philosophy in which some people might criticize and say, oh, well, you're just saying that uh, when something, you do something bad or you do, that the devil made you do it. <laughs> and that's, of course, not the case. You see, the, 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 uh, the, the Edenic question of the choice of Adam to, to eat or not eat of the tree, 
It's okay. He did the wrong thing, so all of humanity is condemned or damned sinners from well, from now forth. Okay, <laughs> that's kind of crazy, but that's of course a coercive philosophy. What mm-hmm. This says that each individual at each moment in life is making that choice constantly. And it's not the choice between obedience and rebellion, but the Mm -hmm. choice between good and evil. That's why the tree, good and evil. They got that much right, but it's totally, (laughs) you know, the twisted, perverted interpretation that there is a good choice. Each moment to say, well, is this going to make people happy or unhappy? Is this going to make me happy, unhappy? Uh, Think it through and say, is this good? Is this empowering? Is this enriching? Is this healthy? Is it those things? Is this going to lead to more enjoyment? All these things, uh, that's the choice I want to make, not these other ones. Mm -hmm. So... uh, that's that. That's the philosophical principle. There is that we, each individual, at each moment in life, are making this cosmically important choice at each moment of our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, like I said, it, it, it's a very um, informationally laden book of things, and I don't think that. I, I don't think one reading is probably enough either, um, as far as, no, you know, commitment. It's a manual to sit there and read through to see what I want And what I would suggest, as I did with other things I've done, is you make your own book. You'd read this one, and then in your diary, in your, you make a thing where you write it out. You say, this is what I'm going to do and how I'm going to uh, uh to, to enact this curriculum for myself. I may go a little faster, I may go a little slower, uh, but I'm going to follow this curriculum. On a, so you have something that I will say in this book that says, what am I to do today? I have an answer for that. This is what you do today and the next day and so forth. But how you arrange that and what it is exactly you do and in what progression is guided there but not mm-hmm. mandated, and mm-hmm. but if you follow it generally, uh, then you will have uh, effects. As I was, uh, in a, uh, anecdote I put in the book, I was convinced at one moment, you know, that uh, that these mantras, et cetera, work, because I tried it out in a moment of crisis, and it was just like crazy. This thing just worked like, whoa, this is like, nothing ever worked like this before. You know, and uh, it's just instant. And I think that was worked so well and so instantaneously at that moment because there was a crisis. There was a really mm-hmm. a need. It's, magic works best in foxholes or wherever. <laughs> you know, as far as you know, you need it. It must work now. It must work. I need. Yeah. I would fight this work now. I will not survive. So at that moment, magic is really, you know, primed for its best effects. So mm-hmm. that kind of thing, but you see, like this is uh, demonstrates itself, and that's what I suggest to people is try it, and but try it in its totality. I have the reading there. You, you, one needs to be. It's not just abracadabra if you say these words without any knowledge about their philosophical, historical uh, importance or, or context. Uh, they probably won't work as well. I would say, because, of course, I had those contexts before I started. So that's why I try to say, look, you need to read some books, get some background. The Internet is a huge resource for this particular tradition because of these 300,000 people in -hmm. the world. Now, these people are, the few that remain, are among the most accomplished, uh, successful in all ways that one can imagine, people in the world. And the Mm -hmm. Internet is full of things that they have created for their own people, which we can access, and is just incredible that such a small group of people can have created so many resources Mm -hmm. for their tradition. It's laid out in a succinct way, 
and there's very little in the way. If one went into a lot of other traditions, you would just be going down a rabbit hole of confusion. Mm -hmm. But one would be surprised at the consistency and how quickly one, such as myself, can absorb and get the principles. And once these principles are internalized into your soul and heart, you mm -hmm. can, it, it just unfolds. And I've had so many Zoroastrians who say, you understand this perfectly, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's because it is intelligible, you know, yeah. as opposed to, well, our sect and our, you know, twisted in interpretation is this, so it mm -hmm. may seem to be that, but really it's something totally different. <laughs> that kind of thinking is completely divic, you know. I mean, that's just, yeah. who needs that in life? Exactly. So. Well, you know, who needs this time to go away so quickly? But we are at the end. So what yes. I'd like you to do is let people know more where they can find out more about you and, and the book and your other books as well. Okay. Well, I'm on Facebook at Stephen Flowers. And uh, I uh, have a, a website where a lot of my books are uh, sold that are not uh, uh, necessarily uh, in big publishers called. And this website is uh, Seek the mystery dot com seek the mystery dot com mm -hmm. and uh, of course uh, most of my books are available on the, right there from Amazon and uh, that's uh, but uh, Facebook is I'm a latecomer to Facebook I'm generally a caveman and uh, <laughs> you know don't have I'm a very uh, untech savvy person and only in the past you know year or so I've been on Facebook but there I am and I you know, and invite to inquiries and so forth from people on this uh, topic. Great. Well, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. And I also want thank to you, thank everybody for listening, those in the chat room, those that will be listening to the podcasts. Um, thank you all. And um, until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at this same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2014. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod. Licensed through Incompetech.com.